Will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the scriptures. Your word says that uh, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of a person's will, but that men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So we invite you to speak to us this morning through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Maybe I was asleep. Did we announce the service times this week? I didn't think so. Okay. I didn't think I was. Saturday night, Christmas Eve, lessons and carols here in the sanctuary at 4 p.m. Sunday morning, one service, and it will be at 10 a.m., one service on Christmas Day, and also one service on New Year's Day. Because I've been told that people go out on New Year's Eve and make merry, and they watch, watch some ball come down or something. I don't know what that is, but I hear people do that. So one service on, on New Year's as well. Also, Cheryl and I would like to extend to you our, our gratitude for your prayers and support this past week. It was a brutal week. But Sam is home, and he's recovering, and we're grateful for your support and grateful for uh, answered prayer and that he's doing well and last night we all parked on the couch and watched a movie and told stories and it was really good and so um, thank you for uh, your part in allowing that to happen with and for us. If you want to follow along this morning we're looking at the book of Romans we're doing the epistles it's a letter of Paul, uh, and Paul is anxious to go to Rome. Rome is the great city of the ancient world, and he had not been there. And he wanted to introduce himself, and he wanted to introduce his gospel to the church that was already there in Rome. And so he wrote a letter explaining both who he was, what he believed, and what his gospel is. And so our text this morning is the greeting from that. Um, there's broad scholarly consensus that Paul wrote this letter from the city of Corinth just before he left for Jerusalem and in the providence of God. Paul was arrested in Jerusalem. That was his last visit to Jerusalem. And he was taken into protective custody by the Romans and taken to Rome where he was placed under house arrest. They didn't give him an ankle bracelet. They um, chained him to a Roman soldier so that he couldn't get up and run away. And uh, there he had a fair amount of freedom. So he invited Jews and Christians to come and, and talk gospel with them. And he had the opportunity that this letter was trying to set up. He had that opportunity in Rome. It was written in the 50s, which would be um, within 30 years of the events of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And so this has ancient warrant. This isn't st stuff that was made up by the church. Um, Bart Ehrman at UNC Chapel Hill says that they elected Jesus God at Nicaea. Uh, prior to that, he was just a man. Um, and so as we unpack this greeting, you will see that that's not what the ancient church believed. Um, and so we turn our attention to uh, Paul. Sometimes this is called the fifth gospel, not in chronological order. There's the first four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then Paul. His was written maybe 10 years or more before, uh, before Mark and some of the earlier gospels. Um, but it's in different in content and different in style. The gospel writers were narrative th theologians. And don't for a minute think that they just wrote a biography of Jesus and they're just giving you the unvarnished history of Jesus. Each one of those is a remarkable theological explanation of Jesus, his life, death, his, his ministry, and what he was doing. But Paul does it differently. He's not a narrative theologian. He's a systematic theologian. And he does his theology under different heads, under different ideas. And he presents it propositionally. And we will see that in this greeting. Every culture has its own rules, its own uh, way to do letters. So in our culture, you start off with the person that you're writing to, and then you tell them what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them who you are when they finally get to the end, as if they didn't know probably. But anyway, um, and in the ancient world, in classical epistolary letter writing, it was done in the reverse. You announce who you are, and you announce to whom you are writing. And Paul does that in these seven verses. But it's like a sausage. He stuffs it full of all kinds of good stuff. Um, and so he followed the rules, but only just barely. Um, and so it's the writer, Paul, 
to the readers, the church in Rome. But before he gets there, he's got a lot of stuff that he wants to tell them. He wants to introduce himself and his message. Now imagine this. Rome is the greatest city in the ancient world. It's the seat of power of the Roman Empire. And the power is held by the Caesar, the Lord. His birthday was celebrated as gospel. His birthday is good news. And one of his titles among many is the Son of God. And so Paul is writing to the church where this guy is in charge, and it's the seat of his power, and he's going to say that Caesar isn't king. Jesus is the real king. Caesar isn't Lord. He's a tin pot dictator, and Jesus is the real Lord. And it took a lot of guts, or as the Jews say, chutzpah, for him to do this and then to send a letter like that to Rome. But that's what Paul does in explaining who he is. He's challenging them to understand the gospel and to live into it. And so he begins this way. Paul, a servant of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, called an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Okay, the word in the Greek is doulos, which is slave. Paul is not a servant. Paul is not a bond servant. But because American history is so fraught with the issue of slavery and all that is attendant to it, uh, Bible scholars are a little jittery about using the word slave, and so they don't. And they say he's a servant, but he's a slave. And a slave is a person who has no rights. A slave is a person of, of humble estate. A slave exists to do the bidding and the, the commands of, its, of his or her master. And so Paul is a slave owned by Jesus Christ. And so he introduces himself first with this title of humility, and then he adds to it an apostle. Now that's a definitely a Christian term. The word apostle in the Greek language simply means messenger. It, it's not a title. It's not an office in the church. It just, it's a word that means messenger, somebody who has and carries with them a message. Now, Jesus gave it dignity and authority when he chose from among his hundreds of apostles, I'm sorry, disciples, 12 to be named as apostles. And he gave them authority and he gave them power to preach his message in the world. And so Paul now is taking on this title of import, and he's taking on this title of greatness by claiming that he is an apostle. He's introducing himself to this group of people whom he has never met and who don't know him or his message. So, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, holy for the gospel of God, holy. See, we think holiness means a certain kind of behavior and being good and being uh, right and, no, set apart. Paul was called a slave. Call, Paul was called an apostle, and he was set apart by God for a particular job. And the job was to give the gospel of God. And so it, it, it doesn't have a religious connotation. It's simply a word that means set apart. And Paul himself understood himself to be set apart. As an apostle, there were some criteria that had to be met. You had to know the historical Jesus, Jesus in the flesh. You had to know Jesus post-resurrection. You had to be commissioned by that Jesus, and you had to be set apart by that Jesus for this role. Um, he has given you his power. He has given you his spirit. He has given you his authority. And Paul is claiming all of those with this language of being set apart. That's his consecration and commission. And to what? An apostleship, so that he is an apostle of God which he promised beforehand through prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So what I'm going to do is unpack this greeting, and I'm going to use an outline that uh, was given or written up by John Stott, S-T-O-T-T. -T. If you don't know that name, it's a name you should know. If you ever come across one of his books, you want to grab that book and read it. Um, but he has six propositions that he says Paul is uh, conveying or communicating in his greeting. He, six things that are important to know about the gospel. As Christians, if you were asked to write a letter to somebody and to explain the gospel in a few short sentences, what would you say? 
So here's what Paul has chosen to say about the gospel. So the first of John Stott's outline is the origin of the gospel. It is, according to the end of this verse, the gospel of God. Our faith, our religion, is a revealed religion. It's not something that was made up by or invented by the apostles. It's not a collection of aphorisms and wisdom sayings. It is not an ethical system. Christianity is not moralism. Be good, be nice, be kind has nothing to do with the faith. Don't believe me, then, as we unpack this, look for those words and see what Paul says about it. It has nothing to do with the faith. And yet everybody thinks that that's what being a Christian is. No. That's got nothing to do with the faith. It originates in God. This is God's plan for rescuing a broken world. And, he says in the second part, that it is attested to by two things. Attested to by the words of the prophets. See, he's not doing it in secret. He's, he's putting it right out there for all of us to know and understand. And so the prophets spoke, thus saith the Lord. They spoke with power. They spoke with authority. And Paul, as an apostle, is taking on the mantle of what was in the Old Testament, the prophet. Called and set apart by God to communicate to his people and to call them back into covenant relationship with their God. That's what a prophet did. And that's essentially what Paul is doing. And so his words were attested to by the prophets, there are 300 or more Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. And so Paul is um, saying that Jesus, this gospel was attested to by these prophets, that the Messiah would be a suffering servant, Isaiah 53. He'd be crucified, Psalm 22, that he would be the high and exalted son of man in Daniel 7. And that's just three of 300 things in the Old Testament that laid out God's plan and attested to it. And then the words of the prophets were inscripturated so that we have not only the Old Testament and the words of the prophets, but we've got the New Testament and the teaching of the apostles. And so they go hand in glove and they attest to this gospel. It originates with God and its revelation. It's attested to by the prophets and the scriptures. And then its substance is Jesus Christ. If you take verse 2 and you put it in parentheses, and it says the gospel of God, and then the next line is concerning His Son. What is the gospel? It's all about Jesus. What's the substance of the gospel? It's all about Jesus. It is His Son. And so uh, we, we turn our attention to this gospel that Paul is preaching. Promise beforehand through His prophets concerning His Son, and then he gives two titles, and he gives two contrasting statements about who the Son is. The first title is, He is the Son of David. Always to be understood as a messianic claim from 2 Samuel chapter 7, God made a covenant with David that one of his descendants would sit on the throne of Israel forever, and this Jesus is a son of David, that he is the fulfillment of that promise that God had made to David. So. But he's human. He's the son of a human being. He's the son of David. And then the next one is, he is the son of God. Again, the Daniel chapter 7. So, uh, concerning his son. And this is also coming from the book of Psalms. There's a messianic royal psalm, Psalm 2. This is where the Jews got almost all of their expectation of who the Messiah would be. Be a conquering general, he'd be a conquering king. Um, but he was also the divine second person of the Trinity, and he was God's son. Psalm 2, verse 7, God says, I will tell you of the decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And Jesus understood himself that way. He referred to God as his Abba, his daddy, his father. He had that kind of intimate relationship with the father, different than the relationship that we have with God, because he was the divine son. And it speaks of two natures, that Jesus Christ was fully human and that Jesus Christ was fully divine. See, they'll tell you the teachers in the universities, that the church decided all that stuff hundreds of years later. Here we have it right here in the pages of the New Testament, and it's got early warrant, and it's within 30 years of Jesus' life on this earth. Then he has two contrasting statements, according to the flesh and according to the spirit. 
And again, the two natures of Christ could be referred to here, that Christ came in the flesh and that Christ rose by the power of God and his post-resurrection ministry is one of power and influence through the apostles whom he has called. But it could also mean uh, the two parts to his ministry. According to the flesh, is that which Jesus Christ did while he was on the earth for those 33 years or whatever they were, according to the flesh. And it was a ministry of humility. It was a ministry of loss. It was a ministry of defeat. He, was die he died and he was put to death on the cross. But that, that was not the end of the story because he's also, according to the Spirit, God raised him from the dead, God vindicated his Christ, and that the message of the gospel goes out in spiritual power by the apostles and by those who are disciples who walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And this was declared to be, this is the substance of the gospel. This was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection of the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So there's the slap at Caesar. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. And Paul puts it in his greeting. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And you can't claim to say that you're a Christian and also a good Roman citizen. This is why Christians were persecuted, because they weren't patriotic, because they wouldn't go to the patriotic parades and say, Caesar is Lord. They wouldn't do it because there is only one real king, only one real Lord, and it's Jesus. And if that inflamed the Romans, then so be it. It did inflame the Romans. And there were often periodic persecutions against the Christians, simply because they would not acknowledge another Lord besides Jesus. Where am I? Verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name. So we had the substance of the gospel, and now we have the purpose of it. The obedience of faith. The obedience of faith. And commentators are split on this. There's three possible meanings of the obedience of faith. The first is the faith is a, a body of belief, a, of content. So that Jude says that the, the, I meant to write to you concerning our common faith, but I found that I had to write to you um, about the faith so that there is a body of dog doctrine, a body of dogma that must be believed. It could be that. But in the Greek, this formation is, they've got five tenses in the New Testament. This is a genitive. So it could be a genitive of origin, faith, coming, or obedience coming out of faith. So think Abraham here. God came to him and said, Abram, get up to the land that I will show you. And Abram got up in obedience, and he went off from Ur of the Chaldees. to He didn't know where he was going. He just got up and he went. And God saw his faith. And how did he see his faith? Because Abram was obedient. So it's a genitive of, of origin that faith comes out of, or obedience comes out of our faith. Faith is never exercised in a vacuum. There's an object of faith. And we owe Jesus Christ our obedience. In the 1980s, there was a big controversy in the church. There were Bible teachers and seminary professors teaching um, that you could go to the salad bar of Christian doctrine, and you could pick and choose, and you could pick Jesus to be your Savior, but you don't have to have him as your Lord and you have him as your savior, and you won't go to hell, and you can live like hell, but you can go to heaven. Um, and th there were a bunch of other theologians who said, no, you can't have Jesus as Lord, uh, savior unless it's a, it's a package deal. He's both savior and Lord. They go together hand in glove. Like Abram, he demonstrated his faith by getting up and going out. We're not saved by good works. The good works don't save us, but they are evidence of our faith, which is exactly what James says. You say you have faith? Show me your works. I'll tell you I have faith, and I'll show you that I have it because of the works that I do. So that their obedience is the appropriate response to one who is our Lord. We must submit to our Lord. We are slaves, like Paul. We must submit and we must obey the commands given to us. It's interesting that uh, um, when Jesus left, he's with his disciples and he gives them the, the great commission, his last commandment. He says, 
go and make disciples. There's as you are going through the world, make disciples. And what is disciple making? Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. He is the commander in chief. He issues the orders. And then we, as his servants, do the things that he tells us to do. So the, the content of the gospel here again, or the purpose, is faith in obedience. And the third possibility is that it's a genitive of equivalence. Faith which consists of obedience or faith which is equal to obedience or is obedience. It's also possible it could mean that. So we know the origin. The origin of the gospel is God himself. We know that it's attested to by the prophets and the scriptures. We know that it concerns his son, Jesus Christ. We know the purpose of it, that we would in faith walk in obedience with our Lord. Anything in here about being good and being nice? There's nothing in here about that. Drives me crazy. What's that got to do with the faith? Nothing. Okay. Where else would we go? Five again. Uh, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. You know, Paul was embarrassed. He was a persecutor of the church. He hated the church. He hated Christians. He made it his business to make their life miserable. He held the coats of people who stoned Stephen to death. And yet on the road to Damascus, he was struck blind. He met Jesus the risen Jesus face to face. He was set apart. He was called and commissioned and made an apostle. And so that's what he's embarrassed about here. He's an apostle only through grace, unmerited favor. Though you don't deserve it, you get it anyway. That's how he became an apostle, and that's how we become Christians. It's God's grace. He extends to us, not because we're tall or thin or beautiful or smart, for no reason whatever, other than he loves you and chooses to extend to you his grace. This is your Christmas present. God's grace to you, Merry Christmas. What else could you possibly want but this unmerited favor from God himself? And so... uh, We received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. And here is the the end result of, of the gospel. It's for the sake of his name. In the Greek, that's the climax of the sentence. That's the end of the sentence. It's to glorify the name of Jesus Christ. The song in Philippians 2, which Paul may or may not have written, is Jesus Christ became a human being. He became a servant. He was obedient He was obedient even to the point of death, suffering death on the cross. And for that reason, therefore, God exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that everyone would declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That this is all sole dei gloria to the glory of God that the purpose of our sharing the gospel, the reason that we do any of this stuff, is for Jesus' glory, for his name to be lifted up and exalted. Okay, where am I? For the sake of his name among all the nations. And this is the scope of the gospel. Who does the gospel go to? The Jews decided that this was good news for us. We're God's chosen people, and it's just for us. And so they hid it under a bushel, and they wouldn't let anybody else have it. No, it's to go to all nations. And the Greek word is ethnos, every ethnicity, every group of people, or as it says in Daniel, every tongue and tribe and nation. And that Jesus has been given a kingdom which will not be destroyed. And he has been given power and authority and dominion. And so that we need to understand that. And that it's not just for us and our little holy huddle. When I was in college, there, were, there was a Christian group on campus. And so I went to it as a young Christian. I'd been a Christian about a year and a half. Guilford College Christian Fellowship. And it was a holy huddle. They'd sit in a room and pat each other on the back and say, gee, isn't it great to be a Christian? And then they'd leave. And that was it. I'm like, this is insane. So I started InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at Guilford College so that there would be some mission purpose. We've got a whole campus full of kids that don't know Christ, and we're just patting ourselves on the back and saying, oh, isn't this great for us? It's for us. It's not for those people that drink on Friday night. Oh, they're terrible people. Ah. 
No, that's exactly who the gospel is for. It goes out to the whole world. It's universal. It's for everyone. And so as we are going through life, we are to make disciples of what all ethnos, all nations. That we're to take it with us wherever we go and share it whenever we can, which is what Paul's doing. He can't help himself. He's supposed to just simply say, hi, I'm Paul. Hey, you guys are the Romans. Greetings. That's all he's supposed to do. But he can't help himself because he's so full of the gospel that he stuffs it in the greeting here. And then finally, he says, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, that we belong to him, that he is our Lord, he is our Savior, he's our owner, we are his slaves like Paul was his slave. And then finally he gets to it. The writer has written, and now who's the reader? To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. To the saints. And we have this weird idea about saints. They're historical personages of great spiritual vitality. Saint Bernard and Saint Francis the Sissy and Saint uh, Gertrude and Saint Margaret. And, and that they were so awesome that they not only did enough good works to save themselves, but they did works of super erogation, works over and above what's necessary. And they went into the storehouse of the church, these extra good works. And if you bought an indulgence, then you could get some of their good works that would put you up over the top and shorten your stay in purgatory or save you from going to hell. And no. In the ancient world, there were two, two kinds of people. Two. There were the saints, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and there were pagans. That's it. And so you, if you're a Christian, are a saint. It has nothing to do with lifestyle. It has nothing to do with holiness. It has nothing to do with all the stuff we think it has to do with. They're not very saint-like. Of course not, because they're a human being. But that's, it's, about, it's about your identity, not about your behavior. That in Jesus Christ, if you are called by him and set apart by him and owned by him, then you also are a saint. And that that's part of this good news that he's sharing and then he finally closes out. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. Grace, unmerited favor. He just beats that drum like nobody's business. Because human beings want to earn their salvation. They want to have some contribution. And we don't make any contribution. We come to God empty-handed. And God extends to us his grace. And so he extends here in his greeting, grace to you, God's unmerited favor for you. Here's your Christmas present. And then peace. And the Hebrew word for this word in the Greek is shalom. Wholeness, completeness, well-being. That you're healthy from top to bottom and inside and out. And that you experience uh, completeness and wholeness and and. I forget which saint said it. Um, Tertullian, I think. No, it was Irenaeus. Irenaeus said the glory of God is a human being fully alive. That's what shalom is. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. You were created by God to live a healthy, whole, complete life. And that you're to have a purpose in your life. And the purpose for Paul and our purpose as followers of Jesus is this gospel that he is proclaiming to this church in Rome. Grace to you in peace from God our Father. And again he repeats, the Lord, not Caesar, the Lord Jesus Christ. During this Advent season, coming to a close this morning as we look forward to the coming of Jesus at Christmas, during this season, again, this is God's word to us. Why this passage? Because it was attested to by the prophets. This is not some new thing that, that people just thought up, but that this was a continuation of a plan that God had been working out from the beginning, and that you are included in that plan. And that you have a purpose in this life as a follower of Jesus and his servant to do the things that he's called you to do. Amen.